meaning what? Like maybe you can't be the foot in the door of the house. What door are you going in? Whatever you have to do. Okay. What do you want to be? I want to be a writer. Right. But. But. Star is probably star. He needs a bullet. Right. So don't take that bullet. Hell no. Hell no. Be a stringer. All right. Because guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up running the photo editorial department, and you're going to be pissed off, and you're going to be you're going to be 35, and you're going to have a kid, and you're going to have a mortgage, and your wife's going to want to go back to school, and you're trapped. You're in prison. You are in you are in a prison of your own making. Yeah. You. The thing is, is that like one of the things, one of the things I do, one of the things I do in life is, is I work with, I, I work with two types of companies, right? One company is just starting, and this is before they have leadership, and the other company has been around forever, and they have a founder. They're very different things, but generally the ones with the founders, these are the really interesting ones. Thirty years, this guy's been running this company, successful, and they bring me in because they sense something's wrong, and. I, I do the same thing. I sit down, and it's always the CEO and the CFO, and it's always the legal guy. They always bring in the lawyer for some reason. And I say to them, so how are you going to get out of jail? And they go, oh, my God. You know, and they assume I've been looking into their tax returns. Right? <laughs> no. It's metaphoric here. Right? You have 30 years of your life into a company that you've built, and you're there every damn day, and nothing's changed because you're in prison. So you got to get out of your own way. So, so don't put yourself in prison. So you want to be a writer? Write. And if you need money, do something mindless. Do some, you know the trick to writing, right? It's writing. And there's also finding that time when you're supposed to write, figuring out when in the day. For me, when I, when I wrote, 8 a.m. to 11, uh, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's it. Useless after that. Useless. Couldn't write a damn thing. Hemingway, 9 to 12 every day. How many books did that son of a bitch write? 9 to 12 every day, five days a week. Then he started drinking and fighting bulls, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, look, find your writing time. Maybe your writing time is 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Okay, if you need money, find a way to make money that allows you to get up at 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. and write. But don't do something close, you know? If you want, I said, you know what? You'll be standing here, right? Here's where you are, going like this. You know, looking at slides and looking at Photoshop. And guess who's right here? You, if you had just held out. And you're looking down this, and then you hate that guy. And that's poison. It's poison, yeah. So, um, foot in the door is brilliant if you wanted to go work in the news department at the Toronto Star and copy edit. And stuff. That's a good path. Photo? No. You'll end up being in the photo department. A lot. It's a, so, boy, I, you know, I've, I've done like three panels and keynotes on that subject. Um, I have two answers. One is that the globalization of content, creation, curation, production, distribution, and all these types of things, if anything is making, I think it's making things more culturally specific. Because I think it's giving voices that never, ever, ever have. I mean, think about it. Canadian, Australian, New Zealand writer bitching about the film industries and socialization and government and tax backs and we're just a location and all this stuff. At least you have a film industry. Botswana doesn't have a film industry. Not so much. You know. But there's kids with cell phones, cameras, making content. So I think that globalization in the true sense of the word, like with a small g as a word, um, has made I think it more important to have a distinctive voice and a cultural point of view. However, Hollywood doesn't give a rat's ass about that. 
I mean, my film company in Australia has a very, very specific mandate. It's funny that you bring this up. Screen Australia has a 40% rebate, and there's lots of banks that'll, that'll, that'll cash flow that rebate, and then there's Film Vic, and there's the New South Wales Film Commission, and they give you 50,000 bucks to get a screenplay done, and da, 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 but they have to be Aussie movies. I'm not Australian. I don't know what an Aussie movie is, right? Why do I not know what an Aussie movie is? I'm not Australian, right? But, so, what I'm saying, good or bad, the, the Canadian Film Commission, the Australian Film Commission, Screen Australia, are there to support those indigenous voices, right? And uh, when I say indigenous, I'm meaning Canadian, right? But, God forbid, you just want to make the wedding crasher. If you want to make the wedding crasher in Canada, you're screwed. You want to make the wedding crasher in Sydney, Australia, you're screwed. Because the system is set up to squish and culturally specify. So I have a film company in Australia that is made that is based on making movies with a capital M. They're just movies. So Australians who want to make movies, not Aussie movies, they come to me. Because I don't know how to make an Australian movie. And I wouldn't be any good at it anyway. And I think that there's brilliant filmmakers and producers in Canada that, um, that should that should be their charge. So I, I think that globalization is making voices more important than anything, but make no mistake, Hollywood doesn't care. They just want a movie with a capital M. That's it. And you can make a movie that has Canada as a backdrop or as a character. Right? There's plenty of those around. I think that what a lot of non-US, non-Hollywood countries are suffering from culturally is how to go from being a tax break location into talented people who have stories to tell. You know, it goes back to focus, right? Decide what you want to say. If you have a Canadian story and it's about Canada and it will be only gotten by Canadians and you don't care, that's how you make a movie, a Canadian movie. But if you want to make a movie in Canada, just happen to be here, great. Then don't go to Canadian Film Commission, Commission come to Hollywood. Let's see, what's today? <laughs> My voice has evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved. Um, you know, one of the biggest things, I stumbled around for five years before I realized I'd written 12 screenplays and knew nothing. I kept writing screenplays about stuff I didn't know anything about, and I couldn't understand why nobody liked them. You know, massive political thrillers about, you know, groups of you know, rebellious militia guys that would steal nuclear weapons and were going to blow up the Pentagon because they were angry with the Food and Drug Administration or something. 22 years old, knew nothing about that, hadn't been in the world, didn't know anything. Writing movies about stuff going on in countries I'd never heard of. You know, didn't leave my country until I was 23. Didn't have a passport until I was 23. Um, your voice is so dependent on your experiences. And that's why all film students do films about suicide. <laughs> right? Dude, my life sucks. My girlfriend left me. I hate her. You know, he broke my heart. He slept with my sister. You know, that's film school, right? Because that's all you know. Good. Good. My God, at least you're leaning into your experiences, right? That's your voice today. You finish one of those, then you do something else. I mean, it's such a good question, you know, because um, your voice has to evolve. And I think that what happens is, is people get this voice, right, and then they stay on it forever. And that's where you get stale. Like, remember, you know, Jim Cameron. You know, James Cameron made Titanic. Everything he's done since there has just sucked, you know, because he went, I'm king of the world. And then he didn't do a damn thing. Nothing from there. Nothing, right? Um, that's my problem with George Lucas. Right? Where's his voice? Um, I think w whatever you're going to do, you have to, you have to evolve your voice. You have to stress your voice. You have to learn new languages inside your own language. You know? the, one of the challenges, I'll, t I'll give you a perfect example. I took on one of this company, the Toronto company, last year because I had led companies, founded companies, run companies, but I had never had a CEO title. 
I mean, and the CEO title wasn't important to me. The responsibilities of understanding finance and budgets and HR and actually doing these things that I went, well, you know, hi, uh, I'm at Syriana. I don't have to worry about HR. Bullshit. You know, you got to know this stuff. If you're going to do something, if you're going to make a movie, you've got to know what the marketing people are doing. Well, how are you going to get to know what the marketing people are doing? Go down the hall and talk to them, they'll lie to you. Go work in the marketing department. Learn that language, and that will help your voice evolve. Because I think that, for me, personally, like, I have only been interesting to myself in, like, the last 18 months. You know? And it's only, it's just like, blah, 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 blah. But I was talking other stuff. You know? Participant, for all of its blessings, I was a mouthpiece for a beautiful, amazing man. I was better at talking about it. I believed in it with all of my heart. But I didn't think it up, right? It didn't make me angry. But when I realized that my role at participant was to become the grand, my title there was the chief vision officer. <laughs> Honest to God, C-level title, right? I was the keeper of the vision. The vision was to leverage the power of the media to inspire social change. What my job was is to walk around and go, hey, finance dude, are you making that decision lensed through the vision? You have to sieve it through the vision, right? As opposed to, I'm going to screw these guys over, right? So, but it wasn't, that gave me additional vocabulary, but it wasn't my voice. I was using my skills to message. But, I mean, I'm 42, and I think my voice showed up about a year and a half ago. But all along the way, you know, you just keep gabbing because you had you had to try. It's like you know, it's like writing. It's like anything else. I mean, you got to throw away a lot of paper. You know, you got to write a lot of stuff before you find something. I mean, I was talking with somebody today that's like, you know, you shoot a roll of 36 frames of film like in the old days. You know, where you get 36, and there's only one good one. You know, um, but it's curation. So, um, so it, it's I'm still stumbling around trying to find it. What else? Yeah. Hmm. So hard. So hard. Everything. <laughs> Everything. Everything. Um, you know, it's funny. Jeff was just asking me about this. Um, when you're starting out and you have a script, right, um, there's a couple ways, right? You, 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 have, you need an agent, but you're not going to get one. Okay. You can't even send it there because they'll send it back on, on open because they can't legally. Um, there's only two ways to get your stuff read by agencies or by producers or by studios is you have to get an agent or you have to send it in by a lawyer or you have to know somebody like me that's kind of in the club that can send a script unsolicited to a studio. But um, more important than access, right? Access is easy. Six degrees of separation, okay? You now know me. You send me a script. I can go, wow, this is great. Buy it, right? So. The access, your access problem just went away. Okay, you email me something, right? Doesn't mean I'm going to read it, but I'm, what I'm saying is the, par the paradigm is that <laughs> paradigm is that access. People go, I have to know somebody. I have to know somebody. No, you don't. You, that's easy. Ask somebody. Ask Nate. You know, like you know, ask somebody. Can I? Do you know a producer? Yes. But get an idea of what if your work is there. Um, and something I really recommend, which is really hard to do, is getting your, your screenplays covered by a studio without it going into the studio's coverage system. And what that means, do you guys know what that means? So here's what happens. Nobody in studios reads screenplays. I don't know if you guys know this, but they don't read them. Um, they send them out, and they get them covered. Because writers who fail become readers, and they do coverage. Um, and they read scripts, and you, pay, you get paid 100 bucks a script. So it's a pretty good living, right? And if you can stay not angry, it's a great foot in the door because you get to know producers, right? But most of them get really pissed off, and they get angry because they're reading, they're like, my stuff is so much better than this, man! You know, and they get all angry, and then they bury the screenplay. But there are great readers, and what happens is that the readers have kind of an intranet. It's kind of like, you know, they have their own version of Facebook where they upload all these screenplays and everybody has access to them. All the studio executives. If one reader 
gives your script anything other than a recommend, it's dead forever. So, because what happens is, is that, so I have a script and I send it to CAA. And they go out and they get it covered and it comes back and it says pass. Then I send it to ICM. ICM goes into the system and says, checks the title and it goes, oh, CAA passed. We'll pass. It's like that. So getting a script covered by a professional reader with the notes, because they give you six or seven pages, character, you know, all this kind of stuff. If you can get that without them logging it into the coverage system, it's brilliant. Because then you're getting actual, objective, studio level coverage. You're just like everybody else, right? They're taking your work seriously, because they don't know. They don't know you're a kid from Toronto. They don't know, you know, you're, you're, they, don't, they don't have any idea. They're assuming somebody at the studio said, read this. It's a little trick. It's so hard to do. But remember that, that producer? Instead of going and talking to Nate or talking to Ted and saying, can you introduce me to a producer? That's a big ask, man. That's because you're not asking for yourself. That's them. That's me. That's me on the line, right? Say, I'd like to get my script covered. Can you help me? Maybe the producer can sneak it in. There's no skin off his or her butt. It's just hard to do. But that, to me, is the, because then you're going to know whether a studio is taking your work seriously. You know, putting them in for prizes, forget it. You know, prizes are run by writers who fail. Right? Who have insurance companies backing them. All right? If you want to sell a screenplay, find out, how, find out what is sellable about it. So a lot of other things, but you need a lawyer or you need a producer. Otherwise, forget it. So, but see, now you know one. Ah, <laughs> oh, there's real piracy and there's piracy fear. Look, people are ripping stuff off, okay? Big deal. You know, come on. Is it really that horrid? Um, I sat on a panel. The, the studios called me in about two years ago because they had a piracy panic. And I was one of the guys they brought in because I had this digital expertise. Um, and they said, what are we going to do about piracy? I said, make stuff cheaper to buy. So yeah, because there's the China problem. 1.6 billion people buying DVDs for 75 cents. Yeah, they're crap! You know, it's some guy with a cell phone camera sitting there dubbing Iron Man. <laughs> Send that stuff to the Chinese version of Netflix and make it downloadable for a buck. Piracy goes away, right? Give people a good product at a good price. Piracy vanishes, right? How do I know this? iTunes. Morpheus, Napster, gone iTunes, 99 cents. Yeah, <laughs> right. So don't pirate movies. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> right? Because you know, the thing is, is that it's not even about me. Piracy is not about making money. Piracy is about freedom. People don't like being told what to do, you know? But we all pay our cell phones, right? Cell phone bills. We all pay them. And we bitch at them every month. Ah, so, right? But we pay them because it's a valuable service and we use it, you know? I just kind of think that piracy is a lobbying term. It's a political term in the studios to exact fear globally because that's what they're good at. Um, it will go away if they just make a good product cheap. So. Um, Well, it was George Clooney. He didn't need a lot of help. You know, he just needed money. Um, 
It's a great question because I think the question is more apropos. Look, I, I, I've, I've been, I'm actually now, really, I have a film career now. Um, then I was spending a, a benevolent, beautiful billionaire's money on incredible movies that should have gotten made. But, you know, when Clooney comes to you and says, I've got this movie that I can make for $8 million and Mark Cuban's in it, um, Mark Cuban's behind it, and I've got David Strathairn, and I've got Robert Downey Jr., it's not a hard decision, right? I mean, Clooney doesn't need help. He just needs money. That's a form of help. But now, when I'm doing this in, with my company in Australia, I'm actually working with writers, and I'm working with producers, and I'm actually able to help them. Um, in a real way, based on my experience, because um, one of the ways I help them is I help them write to get things made. Um, and, and like, perfect example, you know, or so I got sent this script by this guy, and, uh, you know, it was about two cops in Detroit. You know, cop buddy movie. Nothing to do with Australia. It's just a, you know, it's set. And so interior police precinct, you know, the bustle of the cops, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, the first cop, sergeant, whatever, comes in and goes, G'day. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> <sighs> you know, <laughs> is he Australian? Oh, no, mate. No, 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 no. He's from Ohio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he moved to Detroit. Yeah. What? G'day? Oh, you know, uh, like that simple. That, you know, and look, that's, that's, I'm poking fun, sorry, Clyde. I'm poking fun at my beautiful Aussie friend. Um, but I actually read that script. <laughs> um, if the goal is to get it made, there are things you can do. Um, and being a writer is about writing so that anyone who reads it, the director, the actors, the financiers, the studio executives, the agents, the packaging agents, the grip scappers, marketing people, PR people, the digital online folks, the digital media folks, you'll get it. You gotta give them something to do, right? That's why interior room night doesn't work because the lighting department goes, uh, what, what time? Is there any light? Are we in, uh, well, so a lot, hmm. Is there moonlight coming through there? What do you, you know? You gotta help them, you gotta write to help people make your movie. Um, on the producerial side, producers are all about money. Well, you've got to be able to raise money on something. And, you know, I help producers realize the value of their ideas and how to get a great screenplay. Um, producing is hard. I mean, physical producing is incredibly hard, meaning being on a set and actually, actually doing things. Um, development producing is actually is really hard. There's all kinds of producing. But um, I feel like I was given this beautiful gift at Participant that I got to see it at the highest level. Um, and it wasn't that hard for me. Now that's different than stress. The stress was mind blowing. But it wasn't that hard to green light a George Clooney movie. Um, what's really hard is to shape a great idea into something you can execute on. And so I tend to spend a lot of time with people um, getting them out of their own way artistically, right? Your artistic nature is not going to go away. If somebody beats the crap out of you, you know, on your script or on your, your piece, your, your article or whatever, it doesn't mean you suck as a writer. It means, look, I tend to believe if somebody really, really, really gives you a hell of a beating critically, that means they care. Why in the world? Would anybody spend time thrashing a screenplay if they didn't want to make it better? I mean, the worst thing you can hear is, so did you read it? Yeah? What'd you think? It wasn't for me. Oh. <laughs> you know, that's just death. Um, so if I'm interested in something, I tend to go for the throat. And what I can do Personally, my partner in Australia on the other way is a freaking genius. I mean, he's the artist. Like, I don't know how, like, he's a very twisted, crazy, rarefied genius guy. Like, he just, just stuff just happens, magic. You know, it's just, he's a magician. I can shape to sell. He can identify whether it's got a shot to be sellable. 
so I don't do it myself. Like I can't, be, I can't pick that stuff out. You know, I'm looking at the poster, and he's going, "Oh, but the character development, dude, this." Well, those are two really those are two really separate questions. So let me put them in buckets, and let me let me talk about the the reading first. Um, so there are a lot of people that know how to read screenplays in LA. A lot. That doesn't mean they're not in Toronto. It doesn't mean they're not in Sydney, Australia, or in Montreal. There's just a lot more. Um, you have to be very careful whether your belief is based on your opinion of the person, the opinion of your work, or um, your fear. Because the th you know what I really believe in? Get people who've never read a screenplay before to read it. Because they don't know what the hell they're reading. But if they get the story, if they get a kid riding tricycle across the moon and it warms their heart, you win. Because screenplays are formulas. They're formulas. You, you guys have, you know, you guys have Final Draft and all the scripting. You know, it's like you press a button and it goes right in there and you type in Mike. Um, you know, softly says, dude. You know, it's, it's, just, it's a formula, right? It's almost a piece of software. It almost writes itself. Um, so, story, 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 story. It's the only damn thing that matters. I mean, my, one of my dear friends is Warren Zide. He did all three American Pies, all three Final Destinations. Okay, not the best kind of, in his opinion, the star of those movies was the screenplays. It's the quality of the writing. So what I think is, is that get your story right and don't let the idiots who write, read screenplays for a living read it until the story's right. Because you can pretty it up, right? You can pretty it up, you can clever it up. You can snap, crackle, pop it, and all that stuff like that. And that's really part of it. Because people, like, you know how people read screenplays, right? They go to page 10, then they go to page 18, then they go to page 30, then they go to page 75, then they go to page 90. And if anywhere in there there's a page, a block of text this big, you know, Jim went into the cave searching for his soul. Water dripped. Big blocks of text, this big, you're a novelist. You're not a screenplay writer. So I'll answer your other question quickly because I know we've got to go. Um, be evocative, okay? Use language. I will bet you the screenplay to E.T. did not say something like, Mikey rode his tricycle past the moon. Okay? That's the difference between interior room night and interior carousel dust, right? Use language, but don't be a clever son of a bitch. People can figure it out. Don't thesaurus your screenplay, okay? If you're using the word epiphany, you better know what it means. And you better use it correctly. But the thing is, is that look, it's about beauty, it's about power, it's about picking your moments. Don't make every word, you know, dripping with mana from heaven, okay? Be efficient, be economical, and concentrate on making the story points pop. Because that's all the first pass is. Yeah, okay, okay, he did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now I'll read it, right? It's a game, um, and it's a hard game. And the thing is, is that you spend a lot of time in film school being very angry at the game because it's not fair and it sucks and you're going to be better than that. No, you're not. It is fair and you're not going to be better than that. And it does suck. But use it to your advantage. Use it. You know? Think about how much work you don't have to do in a screenplay. You know that on page 10 there has to be the inciting incident. Wow. Just 10 pages? And between 1 and 10, I have to have a personal, professional, and private life scene. 
I have to show my character doing something alone with friends and at work? Hmm. Kind of right in itself, isn't it? Right. Now all you get to be is creative and interesting. You get to concentrate on your characters. You get to throw them up on the stage and let them write the play for you. Um, but work that story to death. And then, then really, let a bunch of people who don't know how to read screenplays read it. Because, man, if, if, you're, if you need somebody to cry on page 75 and your mom is crying on page 75, you hit it out of the park. So, thanks, guys.